The Checkpoint is presented by GM Pharma, the first international multinational pharmaceutical company in Georgia. GM Pharma, to serve those who need it most. The government of Georgia plans to build a new thermal power plant, according to the report submitted by the government to the parliament. As of the document, the work on feasibility studies for the Gardabani 3 and 4 thermal power plant projects has already been completed. The installed capacity of these two thermal power plants should be 500 megawatts. According to the prosecutor's office of Georgia, businessman Galib Osturk has been arrested. He was charged by the prosecutor's office with illegal purchase and possession of a particularly large amount of drugs. According to the prosecutor's office, as a result of the search of Galib Osturk's apartment, a particularly large amount of drugs, seven grams of cocaine, was seized. Lopota Lake Resort and Spa, one of the largest tourist complexes in Kakheti, meets the new season with novelties. This year, the company will invest a total of 10 million lari for the development of the hotel complex. A new food facility has been opened in the departure terminal of Batumi International Airport. The cafe and restaurant will offer passengers a wide selection of different types of Georgian and foreign dishes. Tav Airport subsidiary BTA has invested 400,000 US dollars in the arrangement of the facility. This is The Checkpoints. I'm Eleni Guanjelashvili and The Checkpoints team is ready to start to give you all the news about business and economics. The estimated real GDP growth rate in April 2022 amounted to 2.6% year-on-year and 10.8% in January-April of 2022 year-on-year. -year. In April 2022, the estimated real growth compared to the same period of the previous year was observed in the following activities. Transportation and storage, hotels and restaurants, electricity, gas, steam and air conditioning supply, financial and insurance insurance activities, arts, entertainment and recreation, mining and quarrying. A decline was registered in construction, manufacturing, professional, scientific and technical activities and trade. The Georgian government predicts that Georgia's GDP will reach 66 billion lari in 2022. The government deeply believes that despite the current crisis, real economy growth will reach at least 6% this year. The 2022 budget also provides 6% economic growth. Projected GDP size was planned at 64.8 billion lari. As of the new forecast, the total size of GDP is around 0.8 billion Larry higher compared to the previously predicted one. In the baseline scenario, the growth forecast for 2022 is estimated at 6%, while it is expected to average 5.2% in the medium term. Under such a scenario, in the medium term, the economy will be able to recover about three and fourth of its lost economy growth, the government report said. The World Bank shares similar expectations for economic recovery. A few days ago, Sebastian Molenius, regional director for the South Caucasus of the World Bank, told us that Georgia's economic growth forecast for 2022 would be raised to 5.5 percent. Shortly after the start of the war in Ukraine, the World Bank cut its forecast to 2.5 percent, although the World Bank estimates that 5.5 percent increase is realistic. Just a few months ago, uh, we, we had downgraded our growth projections from 5.5% to 2.5%. The reasons for this downgrade uh, were the great amount of uncertainty due to the war in Ukraine, as well as a sanctions regime against Russia and the implications for Georgia, be it through the remittance channel, be it through the high uh, inflation and, and prices, um, and be it through a hit on trade. Now, 
what we have seen is that the Georgian economy has shown itself and proven itself to be incredibly robust. And we've seen uh, a very impressive growth rates uh, in the first quarter, which is why we are now actually reassessing uh, our growth rates for the year. And at present, we anticipate that Georgia will grow by the original 5.5% uh, over this coming year. Right now, we see quite a bit of growth in the tourism sector. Uh, I think that this is, we see that tourism receipts are, uh, if not exactly at the same level as 2019, but are uh, reaching there at around 70% tourist receipts and uh, income as well. Um, are nearing the 2019 level, so we see a strong amount of growth in this particular sector um, that should really be spilling over to provide additional job opportunities and employment opportunities for the people of Georgia. With that said, inflation still is high, um, and this of course uh, has a big impact on many Georgians, and which is why I can understand why some of these uh, economic spillovers are not yet reaching broad swathes of the population. The Georgian government estimates that GDP per capita will increase from USD 5,000 to USD 6,000 in 2021, an increase of um, around 20 percent. Strengthening of uh, lire exchange rate must also result in economic growth. As of the updated forecast, the volume of the state debt is reduced to 45 percent of GDP, which is five percentage points lower compared to the previous forecast for 2022. Meanwhile, in May 2022, the consumer price index increased by 1.1% compared to the previous month, while the annual inflation rate amounted to 13.3%. With regard to the annual core inflation, the prices increased by 5.9%, while the annual core inflation without tobacco amounted to 6.7%. The following table shows percentage changes in prices for the commodity groups of the consumer basket as well as the relevant contributions to the overall monthly inflation rate. The monthly inflation rate was mainly influenced by price changes for the following groups, housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels. The prices for this group increased by 6.2%. The prices increased for the following subgroups, actual rentals for housing, maintenance and repair of the dwelling, food and non-alcoholic beverages. Here, the price is increased by uh, 0. 8%. The prices increased for the following subgroups, fruit and grapes, uh, bread and cereals, fish, oils and fats, mineral waters, soft drinks, uh, fruit and vegetable juices. At the same time, prices decreased for the subgroup of milk, cheese and eggs. Alcoholic beverages and tobacco, the prices for this group increased by 1.3%. The prices increased for alcoholic beverages and for tobacco products. As for the annual inflation rate, it was mainly influenced by price changes for the following groups. Food and non-alcoholic beverages, the prices in this group increased by 22 percent. Within the group, the prices increased for the following subgroups, vegetables, bread and cereals, mineral water, soft drinks, fruit and vegetable juices, fruit and grapes, fish, oils and fats, coffee, tea and cocoa, milk, cheese and eggs, sugar, jam, honey, chocolate and confectionery and meat. Transport, the prices are up by 20% in this group. Within the group, the prices increased for operation of personal transport equipment, transport services, and purchase of vehicles. Housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels, the prices for this group posted a 16.1% increase. The prices were higher for the following subgroups, actual rentals for housing, maintenance and repair of the dwelling, and electricity, gas, and other fuels. Agriculture, water and land in Georgia can be a source of increased economic productivity, including a transition from low agricultural returns to high value crop production if supported by targeted policies and complementary public and private investments, says a new World Bank um, synthesis report. Agriculture, water and land policies to scale up sustainable agri-food systems in Georgia was launched at an event hosted jointly by the uh, World 
Bank and the government of Georgia this week. The report summarizes the main constraints and opportunities facing Georgia in efforts to boost the contribution of the agriculture sector to economic growth as well as its contribution to diversification, job creation, poverty reduction, food security and climate resilience and mitigation. Successfully achieving these objectives requires an integrated set of multi-sectoral policies which the government of Georgia has already identified and prioritized by urgency and technical readiness. This report clearly is, uh, is important for Georgia, where the agricultural sector makes up uh, just over 8 to 9 percent um, of uh, GDP. Another 7 to 8 percent is in agro-processing. Um, we know that about 19.1 percent of employment uh, is in the agricultural sector, and just under 30 percent of agricultural products um, are exported, making it an important uh, part of uh, foreign currency income for, for Georgia. So as a result, clearly the agricultural sector plays a very important role. Now this report looks, is, uh, looks at improving upon agricultural productivity um, to further increase the chances that uh, Georgia can become a successful exporter of uh, farm products. Um, we believe that uh, there are three aspects to it. Number one, climate smart agriculture. Um, here we need to improve upon uh, and adapt new technologies um, and we also need to enhance the management skills of the farmers here in Georgia. Um, land is going to prove another important part, uh, making sure that we have a certainty, a proper cadastro system that provides land and property rights uh, for farmers here in Georgia and that these are appropriately used. And then finally, making sure that we have climate smart irrigation schemes here in Georgia that provides water to Georgian farmers to be able to, uh, to produce uh, better yielding crops. The land and uh, uh, irrigation is a uh, key assets for the agriculture development together with the uh, human capital, of course. Uh, um, today, uh, the reports are discussing these two uh, main um, topics, uh, uh, land and uh, uh, land-related issues, starting from the registration to the consolidation and, and so on, and also infrastructure on it. Because uh, especially uh, in today's world, when we are talking about climate change, the uh, irrigation system is uh, utmost important for, uh, for the agriculture development. So we hope that uh, those reports will help the government to shape the um, up-to-date uh, uh, and uh, up-to-date policy that will be implemented in the short uh, as well as uh, medium term and long run. We asked how the World Bank sees its role in supporting Georgia to develop its agriculture sector. Right now, uh, we are in the process, uh, and this is the reason why we're gathered here today, is to disseminate the analytical findings. So at the World Bank, we always start off uh, by ensuring that we have an appropriate fact base, the analytical underpinnings to uh, provide policy advice to the government sector, but also advice to the private sector, to farmers, on how to, again, increase productivity and move the agricultural sector forward. In addition, we are in discussions with the Ministry of Agriculture and Environmental Protection, as well as the Ministry of Finance, uh, to uh, design a, an investment project that would again look at investing in modern irrigation schemes, um, climate smart agriculture, um, as well as securing land rights and with a cross-cutting theme of digitization to make sure that we can again increase productivity in the agricultural sector. After agriculture, let's look at tourism, since it is a big driver of Georgia's economy. How to improve the service quality of the Georgian tourism sector? That's a million-dollar question, as customer satisfaction is one of the key reasons why foreign travelers decide where to spend their vacation. On this issue, Georgian Tourism Administration organized a masterclass for Georgian hoteliers and restaurateurs. Keynote speaker was Mr. John Scholl, a president and founder of Service Quality Institute. Mr. Joel was um, our guest at Forbes Studio and discussed with our journalist Shotat Gashalashvili about the masterclass and ways the Georgian tourism sector can improve quality of service. Hello, Mr. Shaw. Thank you for your time. Shota, you're welcome. Thank you. My first question is: Could you tell us about your uh, uh, about the purpose of your visit to Tbilisi uh, and your first impressions of Georgia? Well, this is my first trip to Tbilisi, and I love the people. 
It's a beautiful country. I've been treated very well here. So I've really enjoyed my stay in uh, Georgia. And the Tourism Administration invited me here to do a seminar for several hundred people in tourism to help them understand the power of what I call the service strategy. I think there's an opportunity for tourism to develop Georgia to be the, the country for, for the best customer service in the world. That would be the altruistic objective. Uh, you're known for wine and great food. Well, what would happen if in the world people said, Where's, where is the best customer service? And they said, it's Georgia. So you would have more people from Dubai, from Israel, from Europe, from the United States coming, from every parts of the world. Uh, so, but you, in order to do that, <clears throat> all companies show to have to be providing an awesome customer experience with 100% of their employees. And what is the role of uh, investments, both uh, local and uh, foreign direct investments in the tourism sector uh, in developing, for example, not only infrastructure, but the customer experience? Well, I used this in my seminar yesterday. Most hotel owners, if you gave them an opportunity to spend $5 million on a capital renovation project, their heart would go boom, boom, boom. I mean, they would be absolutely excited, OK? And then if you asked them to spend $5,000 developing their people, they might have a quick heart attack and die right in front of you. Okay? So the, the difficulty is that companies don't value employees. You know, everything I teach is based on, on two simple things. You've got to love your customer, and you've got to love your employees. If you don't love your employees, they're going to deliver poor customer service. And you're going to have really high employee turnover. Uh, so you want to develop high-performing, customer-driven employees. And then your revenue can just skyrocket. This is the easiest method, the fastest method for growth of anything a company will ever try. So thinking of your vast experience, including working with Hyatt uh, and other renowned names in this sector, uh, what, what best practices Georgia can learn? I'd say the best practices you want to focus on several key factors that I teach. Speed. People want things now. Not in 24 hours, not in two hours. They want it now. Okay. So in the mindset of employees in the world is slow. The second thing that I think is really a slight edge competitive advantage for tourism is for employees to remember the customer and use their name. It's, it's, you know, it's like cosmetic surgery. You do the cheeks and the nose and the eyes. Well, what would happen if somebody came into any tourism operation here in Georgia, and all the employees use the customer's name. To the, and the people coming to Georgia are not poor people. You know, tourism is not built on poor people. It's built on people with money. And they have high egos. They have money. And they want to be recognized. And there's nothing more important than using their name. Uh, another thing that I think is critical is that you have to train and develop all employees on the skills and the art of customer service. There is no educational system in the United States or in Georgia that's going to train your hundreds of thousands of employees in whatever business you're in. So if you want to have, whether you have 10 employees or 200 or 2,000, if you want customer-driven employees, it's your responsibility to build the employees, to develop the employees. And you've got to get away from the concept that there's a magic program that you're going to buy. You're going to dip these young employees in. The average age is very young here in Georgia. And all of a sudden, a person goes through maybe a one-day training seminar, and they're perfect for the rest of their life. That's like reading Forbes once. And you say, well, I know everything now. Well, every month, you've got a new issue, and you, need, you learn new things. So you have to constantly be developing people. So yesterday you had a meeting with Georgian uh, tourism executives and a number of 
uh, people who are uh, employed in the uh, tourism sector. What were the main um, questions and most frequently asked questions from them? Could you tell us? Uh, the, the questions were not a lot, uh, but it was more on, you know, how do we make this happen here in Georgia? Uh, how, how do we develop people? How do we motivate people uh, to high levels of performance? Uh, one of the things I teach is, is how do you motivate people without using money? Money has got handcuffs on you. It has tremendous limitations. You can get 10 times more out of an employee using recognition. But most employees, they get very little love, very little appreciation, very little recognition. Okay? And so the reason they leave, and there's a lot of employee turnover, is because nobody values them. They're just a number. They're just a, a suit, an empty suit. And if they don't work out, that's fine. Go work somewhere else and we'll pay you $300 a month or whatever. And we got to change that so that you develop the very best people that you've got, high-performing, customer-driven employees. Thank you, Mr. Shaw, for your answers. Thank you. Now, let us look more broadly and ask the main question, how should Georgia lead the way in a world full of current unimaginable challenges? Here's what some prominent IFIs have to say on the issue. It's indeed a very tricky question. I think we all wish we had a crystal ball. Um, there are a few things Georgia can do which is quite uh, ready at hand, and one is, of course, to enhance the energy security. And this is an obvious area for both domestic and foreign direct investment to Georgia, huge potential, and we should just get on with it. Um, another thing is the supply chains, where Georgia has uh, part, it's part of the logistics chain that Sebastian was talking about, I would very much agree. But also there are opportunities with companies that uh, want to change the location of production. We also see a number of Georgian companies who want to increase their production of whatever they're doing to compensate for the, for the broken supply chains. And I think here Georgia can really step up and, and do more. And I think this is responsibility of all of us, the IFIs, the local banks, uh, the international banks, to support the entrepreneurs active in the Georgian market, regardless of their nationality, foreign or, or uh, Georgian. Uh, then I would like to also say that this is also an opportunity to further enhance access to finance and inclusion of very small scale entrepreneurs into the formal economy. Uh, we saw the digitalization take quite a huge leap during COVID, and I think we can build on this, and we can build on making sure that the small companies in the remote area, say in the tourism sector, actually get access to finance so they can then grow their business. Again, this is the responsibility of all of us, and we all need to cooperate to, to make this happen. Uh, last but not least, I would actually use this opportunity to upskill the country a bit. Again, coming back to digitalization, which really took a leap during COVID, uh, we need to continue to make sure that uh, students get the opportun uh, opportunity to get an education that leads to good jobs. Interesting jobs, jobs where they do want to work, so you don't absolutely need to migrate to a big city or abroad. So this is again something that uh, we can, it, it's difficult, but since we are facing a very difficult situation anyway, let's just take on yet another challenging um, uh, topic. Yeah, we did have the opportunity today to present to uh, the government, also to, to the NBG, um, our country economic memorandum, which is essentially our um, view of the economy as it is today, but also looking at opportunities uh, moving forward. And um, I want to perhaps start where, where uh, Yukova ended, which is on, on the resilience, on this positive note on resilience. And, and I think this is the first um, you know, aspect that I really want to laud uh, the, the, the government and also the NBG for is, is the way that they have now managed multiple crises. Um, I don't know that many countries really have fared that well. Um, you know, there's been the, you know, the oil shock. Uh, there has been the COVID crisis. Now the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, you've had neighbors at war as well with one another. And really, I think very sound macro uh, sort of fiscal policies, you know, building up reserves, um, you know, quick, decisive uh, decision making at certain points in the crisis, I think really helped Georgia weather a lot of these storms and come out of these uh, multiple crises in relatively uh, good shape. And in fact, if you take a step back and again, look at the big picture, I mean, Georgia has averaged 
five, over 5% 5 growth over a 10 year period. Yes, it has been hit hard during the COVID crisis. Yes, we saw an, an extraordinary drop in, in GDP, which by the way, you saw across the region, but particularly Georgia was hard hit, given that it's a you know, small open market economy dependent on tourism, but we saw the recovery equally strong. And now in the first quarters, I mean, the results are, are truly impressive, which again shows us just how resilient uh, Georgia has. And this is government, but it's also the private sector, financial sector, and, and really the, the, the people of Georgia that have really done, an, I must say, an extraordinary job in, in managing uh, through these uh, multiple crises. Um, with that said, um, and as you rightly point out, there is, I think now comes the challenging time, the difficult road, because Georgia came over the last 10 years from a relatively low base and started on some of these reforms quite late, and now comes this tricky part where you're, Georgia is an upper middle income country. Now in order to take, and what we refer to, to overcome and to leap this middle income trap, to become a rich country, an OECD country, and, and, uh, a high income country as we say, this is the challenging part now. And this is where Georgia now needs to really double down on some of the reforms. I think first and foremost, when we discussed this today, um, human capital. Important aspects and investments are needed to improve both better health and in particular education outcomes. Uh, number two, productivity, in particular at the firm but also sector level. I think important investments need to be made to ensure that firms are more productive, that they grow, and that they create better paying jobs. Right now, unemployment is at a very high rate, and if you unpeel and unpack it, even the employment numbers are relatively, I wouldn't say weak, but you see a lot of uh, jobs more at the low, sort of uh, low page, low income uh, sector. And I think that it's important that we create better and better and higher paying jobs um, in the economy. And again, that's gonna require firms to grow, in particular in the service sector, and that's gonna require in turn better skilled and better um, educated labor as well to be able to meet that. Third, I think um, connectivity is going to play an important role, a critical role. There's a big opportunity now in the middle corridor connecting China and Europe uh, through the South Caucasus, in particular with the Russia uh, sanctions regime in place right now, that I think Georgia can benefit from, but important investments need to be made, both in infrastructure, but almost even more importantly on the soft side, trade, logistics. I think uh, important uh, uh, improvements need to be made. Um, and then um, I think, uh, I, I think I'll leave it at that for now. There are other challenges, yeah. but those are three main ones. Just if you may, one word of caution. I think many people are saying that the COVID crisis is over. I fear what's going to happen uh, come autumn when the next wave comes. I know that right now, and it's a truly a pleasure to see everyone without a mask, um, you know, the economy roaring back to life, but I am quite fearful of the fact that only 35 to 40% of the population, and the number is much higher um, in, among the elderly population, what will happen in fall when a new variant, uh, God forbid, you know, occurs. And I think more needs to be done uh, to, to, uh, to really double down and in particular get the elderly vaccinated. And then um, finally, the impacts of the war in Ukraine, the economic impacts, again, the short-term shock, I think, has been withstood, as I just mentioned. But I do fear that there are longer-term impacts. You had a very nice slide um, showing all the you know, potential you know, reduction in growth in some of the bigger economies that Georgia uh, trades with, and I think uh, that's going to be, bring some uh, dark clouds in the world. Recently, we also, together with colleagues from other institutions, conducted a study recovery uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And one of the first conclusions is that across the region, the GDP declined by approximately 4% in 2020, but then the policy support was unprecedented and amount to around 6% of GDP. So thanks to it, the recovery process, of course, there were many problems, the losses were contained and the private sector balance, sheet, balance sheets were protected. And now the question is, in the wake of the next crisis, how resilient these economies can be? What is there? Um, in 2021, we had also unprecedented volume of loans we gave all over the world in 160 countries we work in. It was over 90 billion euro and the structure of the portfolio, where also support to SMEs was at unprecedented level of almost half, 45 billion euro, proved to us that tapping the pandemic, investing in climate change, 
and uh, financing recovery goals are mutual, mutually inclusive goals, so it goes all together. Now coming more specifically to the question after this introduction, yeah? So of course we have tragic loss of life in Ukraine uh, caused by uh, Russian aggression. We have uh, in crisis in, in, in Europe related to, to the war caused by Russia. And here in this region we have kind of major shift. Economic, geopolitical happening in front of us. Yes, so it's a big question mark where it will lead. And then what we found in this study we did together with, uh, with our colleagues from other institutions is that what is important is also structural conditions for the business to grow. And here I wanted to mention a few points. Uh, my first point is that for Georgia, uh, there are some tools on the table that the country can tackle. First of all, is association with the EU and different comprehensive free trade area. So if we talk about new trade routes, new connectivity, connectivity to new markets, not connectivity in the sense of infrastructure, there is already regulation that requires further implementation, but it improves the position for shifting the trade somewhere else. Uh, then uh, my second point is, of course, um, related to the support from the development community and economic and investment plan where the challenge of the European Union, where the challenges that are related, for example, to middle corridor development or to economic inclusion of enterprises in the country, for example, in rural areas, are already included. So this is also the part of support that can be tackled and be used. So uh, one of the major points uh, proved by the pandemic is the inclusion into digital sphere, both for citizens and for the enterprises. So then the investment process of the government, which is already started and we are doing together with the World Bank a project under, uh, under that economic and investment plan in the Western Georgia, is related to digital infrastructure in rural areas. Then uh, the third thing is all the structural reforms for the business to grow. And then last but not least, I want to mention something specifically related to banking sector, because this was quite surprising in the study we conducted that we discovered that there is quite a number of enterprises, especially young enterprises or SMEs in the region. So I'm sorry, I do not have the granular data for Georgia that are financially autarkic and voluntarily so. So they do not want or do not need or do not feel that it's profitable for them to engage with the banking sector to invest. But on the other hand, they deprive themselves of the certain growth path that can be, uh, that can be provided by such financial inclusion. And I think this is a challenge uh, for, for all of us and also for the banking sector to bring these enterprises to the financial system. And now, building on EIB's last point on the financial system, we looked into the study that ADB, Asia's Development Bank, pulled together last year and looked at the Karak region specifically. Globally, 1.7 billion individuals have no access to banking services, while those with access to finance pay a hefty cost for financial services. In recent years, this has been a surge in mobile phone ownership and the use of the internet. Out of the 1.7 billion unbanked adults, 1.1 billion own a mobile phone. In developing economies, 79% of adults own a mobile phone. Digital banking, which uses mobile and internet technology, offers an opportunity for reaching the financially excluded and underserved segments of the population, particularly in remote regions and communities. It has the potential to transform the financial inclusion landscape by offering cost-effective and easily accessible financial 
financial services. Many Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation CARAC member countries lag behind in providing services and infrastructure that are critical to increasing financial inclusion and their digital adoption is among the lowest in the world. Georgia is among the leaders with a percentage of the population owning a bank account. However, more than half of the population of the CARAC countries are unserved by any financial service that could have potentially transformed their economic and social well-being. Georgia is also ranking among top countries when it comes to accessing financial institutions through a mobile phone or internet. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, for my uh, study, I intensely uh, did not uh, uh, include China in the analysis uh, because, uh, because of its size asymmetry and, and, and its advancements uh, in, uh, in, in, in technology and, and the financial inclusion. But yes, in my study, I, I, I re referred China as, as one, of the, uh, one of the examples for other countries to follow. So I will be focusing on only uh, uh, 10 member countries. And uh, if we look at uh, Georgia's position among carry countries, uh, and uh, if we look at the indicators that I have uh, analyzed uh, in my study, Georgia is uh, very well positioned in uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the indicators that I have studied. Uh, I'm not very good at numbers, so I have to look at some numbers regarding Georgia. So, uh, for example, if we uh, if we look at, uh, at account ownership, uh, which is uh, one of the criteria to measure uh, financial inclusion, uh, Georgia is second only to uh, Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia in Mongolia, 93% population has uh, a bank account. Which is uh, which is a very high number uh, if we if we compare uh, with the global average, uh, because the global average is uh, is uh, is low. And if we look at Georgia, uh, Georgia in Georgia, like 61% of the population has a bank account, which is again a, a very high number uh, as compared to other member countries. The, for comparison purposes, uh, if we look at other uh, CARIC member countries, uh, for example, Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, they are very big countries in terms of population. But in Pakistan, you would be uh, surprised to know that only 21% uh, uh, people in Pakistan have, uh, have a bank account. And also uh, some more clarification about these numbers, uh, uh, because uh, I, when I was uh, doing my study, I only uh, looked at uh, uh, data which was available. And the year for which the data was available uh, was uh, to, uh, 2017. And I'm sure uh, since then, a lot has uh, changed in the region and also for Georgia. And if we also look at uh, uh, look at mobile money accounts, as you see, mobile money accounts are gaining traction worldwide. And in uh, the areas and the regions where these traditional banking sector is unable to reach uh, to the marginalized people, people who are at the fringes, who are at the frontiers, these mobile money accounts are making a lot of difference. And we have many examples in the world. And one prime example is uh, Kenya, uh, because Kenya in Kenya, this mobile money uh, uh, accounts have actually re revolutionized uh, financial inclusion. So if we look at uh, if we look at this criteria, uh, we see uh, Georgia is not doing very well uh, because uh, Pakistan and Mongolia are only two countries in the region who are uh, doing uh, great in terms of mobile money accounts. But Georgia is uh, lagging behind uh, other countries uh, in the region on this particular indicator uh, that is mobile money accounts. But if we look at uh, bank account ownership by uh, by income groups, uh, we I actually uh, compare like 60 percent uh, uh, richest people and the bottom 40 percent uh, poor people. And uh, on this particular uh, criteria, uh, uh, of this uh, 60 uh, richest 60 percent, 71 percent people own an account in Georgia, and uh, for bottom 40 poor 40 percent. Uh, 46 percent owns an account, which is quite uh, a normal, uh, uh, like in other countries, because the rich people they are expected to have bank accounts. They are expected to have uh, more funds to uh, keep in, in deposits. So that is um, in line with the theory. Uh, if we look at some uh, other uh, like indicators for Georgia, for example, if we look at the gender gap in terms of uh, bank account opening. In, in the Karak region, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Mongolia, Uzbekistan, and Azerbaijan, uh, they demonstrate the smallest gender gap. So that means male and female have equal access to bank accounts in these four countries. Uh, and Georgia is not far away from, uh, far, far away from uh, these four countries. 
because in in georgia uh, the female have like 64% uh, a bank account and uh, males have uh, uh, 58% uh, bank accounts that means there is a small uh, percentage points differential between uh, male and female bank accounts but it is a good thing that the female are more active in opening uh, bank accounts than males in georgia uh, also, there is another criteria we use uh, that is uh, borrowing and saving patterns among older adults. Uh, so I looked at uh, these indicators and I and I found that Georgia is very well placed in terms of borrowing. Uh, for example, uh, about 50% of its uh, uh, adult uh, population uh, borrowed some money in 2017. That manifests uh, Georgia's uh, uh, Georgian people's uh, trust in the in the banking sector, the financial sector. And uh, also, it, it is also very encouraging to see that uh, along with Mongolia, Georgia is uh, the only country that uh, from where the most of borrowing has, has been sourced in the formal sector. Uh, unlike other countries like Uzbekistan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, most of the borrowing is, uh, is, borrowing is from family, from friends, from peers, from the informal sector. But in Georgia's case, most of the saving has come from the formal sector. So that means people still trust the uh, trust the traditional banking sector. And uh, in terms of uh, a fintech adoption, uh, that is a proxy. Uh, I mean, typically among other things, the use of internet and mobile phone uh, are basically used as a proxy uh, to uh, measure the fintech adoption in any country. So if we look at mobile phone subscriptions in Georgia. Uh, you would be surprised to see that uh, Georgian uh, mobile phone subscription is 144% of the population. That means there are more uh, cellular subscriptions in Georgia than the population. That also means that uh, people actually subscribe to more than one cellular networks. And this uh, subscription is uh, way higher than the global average. The global average is 60% of the population has uh, access uh, as a mobile phone subscription but in georgia's case it is way higher than than the global average uh, similarly if we look at the internet uh, usage in in georgia 69% uh, of the population has access to internet uh, whereas the global average is uh, only 57% that means the fundamentals are there uh, for georgia to actually deepen uh, financial inclusion but on some uh, some other uh, indicators uh, for example uh, using uh, internet uh, for making purchases uh, georgia is not really uh, doing well uh, as compared to other caric regions so these are the basic uh, indicators we used and uh, we also looked at uh, georgia's position so uh, we can safely say georgia is uh, performing uh, way better than its peers in the caric region but uh, in most of the indicators but in some indicators uh, there is still some work to be done in georgia Thank you, thank you, Halid. Uh, very, very interesting to hear specifically about um, about uh, Georgia. The the country is uh, currently discussing this notion of of digital Larry. What would be your uh, thoughts on that? Could that uh, um, help uh, improve those areas that we have been um, discussing? Is it uh, uh, more of an opportunity or more of a challenge at, at this point? Would you say Georgia is? Uh, is, is ready to, to discuss uh, such a notion? Uh, well, I think this is a very interesting question and uh, probably I'm not uh, very well qualified to respond to this, but still I will uh, uh, share my thoughts on this. Uh, I think the jury is still out uh, as, to, uh, as to measure the impact of, uh, of uh, digital currencies on, on financial inclusion. Uh, financial in, uh, this digital uh, central bank digital currencies, as as the term we use, uh, is uh, generally perceived as an alternative way to uh, to uh, to deepen financial inclusion uh, and also to uh, you know do away with these uh, traditional uh, cumbersome procedures of bank opening, the collateral issues, the creditworthiness, and uh, if we look at some statistics and some data globally. Uh, Nearly nine, uh, I think the 90 countries have actually started discussion to uh, to adopt uh, digital currency, and some countries, including Bahamas, has ex already uh, introduced this currency. And uh, we have uh, seen, uh, we have heard about uh, a digital yuan uh, in China. That is, a, uh, they are piloting this in China, and maybe at some point in time they will roll over, uh, roll out in, in in the entire country. 
And according to this uh, Bank for International Settlements, uh, which is, uh, as you know, is a, a central bank's bank uh, based in Basel, Switzerland, uh, they actually predict that uh, uh, by 2025, uh, uh, about 20% of the world population will be uh, uh, will be served through this uh, 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 this uh, central bank's uh, digital currencies. So uh, they have the promise. They have uh, uh, they have the potential to uh, revolutionize financial inclusion. Uh, because they offer an alternate way to, uh, to, to, to reach out to marginalized people who have been underserved uh, for years and decades. Uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, still some mechanism has to be devised as to, uh, and also some customization uh, will be needed uh, to cater to the basic needs uh, of, of poor when we, when we design such, uh, such currencies, uh, such digital currencies. And also, uh, maybe uh, I, I'm sure the central bankers, uh, they are more qualified to uh, talk on this, but I think uh, uh, some caution also uh, uh, would need to be exercised uh, uh, when, uh, when these uh, digital currencies are announced, as we have seen in the case of crypto is now going down very quickly. And uh, uh, Bitcoin is losing much of its, its steam and value. Uh, and uh, also there are some uh, risks for financial stability and uh, money laundering issues will, uh, will also be highlighted uh, when uh, we have these digital currencies. So uh, it has promise and uh, there is still a lot of work to be done and uh, we do not have any good example in front of us uh, which we can you know, study and then uh, make an advice for Georgia. Economies in the region are at varying stages of development, ranging from low income to upper middle income, with an average per capita income of around 3,000 US dollars. They also differ significantly in terms of socioeconomic indicators. When it comes to the provision of services and infrastructure that are critical to increasing financial inclusion, CARAC members are in general lagging in terms of access to the internet, transport linkages, and government facilitation. The average subscriptions to cellular networks are high, but uh, the problem of low internet penetration persists and often below global averages. Without adequate internet penetration for high bandwidth, mobile technologies harnessing fintech to achieve financial inclusion will continue to be difficult even with a high mobile subscription level. If we look at the um, Karak region overall, what could be uh, identified as um, as the main challenges of uh, why these these tendencies that you have highlighted in your study um, are not um, are not in a, in a better better position? Well, if we, if you look at the Karak region, uh, Karak region is the home to over uh, three hundred million people and. Uh, uh, that is a, a, a big market, uh, 300 million people. Uh, but, uh, and also if you look at uh, the demographics, uh, I think uh, more than 50% of the population is between the age of 15 and 64. Uh, so that means there is a, there is a, there's a big uh, young market in, in, in the region. The young population is very high. And uh, for these young adults, their uh, financing needs, their borrowing needs, their saving needs, their investment needs are very high. So it is uh, it offers a great opportunity for the CARIC member countries, the private sector, and multilateral development partners to join hands and devise strategies to uh, provide financial services to the, these unserved uh, population um, in, the, in the CARIC region. But yes, there are uh, certain um, uh, certain barriers which uh, I actually uh, looked at when I was uh, uh, working for this uh, working on this uh, this study. One is the uh, absence of uh, integrated uh, financial inclusion strategy. Uh, I when I uh, when I was looking at uh, certain uh, some strategies in uh, in the member countries, I found out that only Tajikistan and Pakistan had uh, dedicated uh, financial inclusion strategy. Uh, why I'm I emphasizing this point is basically, I mean, given the importance and centrality of finance for innovation and entrepreneurship, I think it is very important that the countries uh, country realize that uh, they need to have a dedicated standalone uh, financial inclusion strategy and not include financial inclu inclusion as a chapter in their overall national development strategy. Because by doing so, you are actually uh, kind of uh, uh, relegating it to a, a less important issue. Uh, to me, it is a very important issue. And uh, as, as you know, the process of uh, strategy formulation, uh, a strategy formulation includes 
a very broad based uh, comprehensive stakeholder uh, consultations with many stakeholders and in the strategy you have strategic objectives you have goals you have targets then you have outcome and output indicators and then you have means of verification and then you can hold uh, staff accountable if uh, they are unable to meet the targets so in my understanding it is very important and there are success stories for example uk brazil malaysia uh, tanzania south africa they actually adopted a dedicated financial inclusion strategies and they have uh, recorded a uh, high growth in financial inclusion levels in their countries uh, but also there is a catch um, just uh, having a financial inclusion strategy is not uh, sufficient uh, because uh, there are allied uh, factors that uh, play a role. Uh, for example, Pakistan is a good example, puzzling example, basically. Uh, it had a financial uh, sustainable, uh, financial inclusion strategy in 2015, uh, but since then, there hasn't been any much progress uh, in terms of uh, financial inclusion levels. Uh, only few, uh, there has been a marginal progress, and you would be surprised to know about Pakistan that only 7% of its women have, have a, a bank account. So that means uh, nearly 100 million people, uh, uh, half of the uh, population is out of this uh, financial mainstream. So this is one factor. Then also there are uh, uh, certain factors in the Karak region. Uh, for example, uh, there are access issues. Uh, if we look at uh, the, uh, the number of bank branches and ATMs, uh, uh, half of Karak member countries are below the global average. So that means access is pretty uh, not there. Uh, and also, uh, then there are, are uh, certain uh, cultural and trust barriers in, in the Karak region, which are also playing uh, their uh, role uh, and uh, keeping people out of this financial mainstream. So, so there are uh, some more issues also, uh, which are just holding back prog progress uh, in, 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 in the Karak region. Um, uh, talking about the, the potential uh, benefits, are these like, um, like measurable uh, benefits, um, like in, in figures, in, in numbers? Does it translate into, I don't know, like economy growth, certain level of economy growth? Does this inclusion help uh, to build some kind of like welfare, overall welfare in, in the countries, in the region? Well, uh, this, uh, as you know, we are living in the age of technology and uh, the more technology we use, the more benefits we will accrue. And uh, this is uh, true in, uh, in terms of uh, adopting these uh, digital uh, technologies uh, because they carry huge potential uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, improve efficiency, uh, reduce the leakages and uh, uh, boost economic growth. And uh, according to some, uh, some estimates uh, by some consulting firms, uh, uh, this, this number, uh, as I mentioned in my study, there are uh, 1.7 billion people who are uh, out of this uh, financial mainstream. And if you bring them into the financial mainstream, uh, the benefits are uh, multiple and they are huge benefits uh, uh, for, the, the, for the developing countries, for the businesses, for the governments, and for the individuals. Uh, for instance, if uh, all these people are uh, uh, brought into the financial mainstream, uh, the loans extended to the businesses and individuals uh, will reach uh, uh, will uh, will reach around like two trillion dollars uh, by the end of uh, uh, by the end of 2025, and similarly, the it will boost uh, government savings to the tune of 100 billion dollars uh, by reducing the leakages and the fraud that is uh, that is that generally happens when uh, when the technology is not used and the manual payments are made from government to citizens. Uh, similarly, uh, there are estimates that uh, it will add like uh, nearly three trillion dollars to uh, to the economies of developing uh, countries uh, if uh, this 1.7 billion people are uh, uh, are, are served uh, through uh, this uh, by providing these financial services. Uh, similarly, the governments are uh, expected to earn uh, hundreds of uh, billions of dollars uh, as a tax money. And along the along the way, uh, it is estimated that by uh, 2025, uh, nearly 95 uh, million jobs will be created in the developing economies. So this uh, technology, you know, the digital technologies, carry huge potential. Uh, it's up to us. Or up, it's up to the governments how we actually harness this technology uh, for our collective benefit. Uh, what what is the role, Khalid, in all of this uh, of the financial um, education, uh, and also how would that, uh, um, for example, uh, 
um, affect uh, human capital development? How would that affect, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, um, employment skills, um, all of this? When, when you are familiar with this uh, technologies, when you are able to, uh, to work better with the, uh, with, with, with the, with the modern time? I think this uh, financial uh, education is very important. Uh, uh, as I said, we are, uh, as you said, basically, we are in 21st century, that is a century of technology and innovation. And uh, if you are uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, financial education really helps you understand your, uh, your saving needs. Uh, your exp uh, you can better manage your expenditures. You can better uh, manage your uh, insurance issues and uh, you can lean against uh, uh, unexpected, unanticipated financial shocks. Uh, through opting for uh, for uh, for insurance services, and similarly, you can raise funds uh, to finance your innovative ideas. So that means, uh, if you are uh, financially educated, you you have the, this opportunity to improve your skills by leveraging these finances to uh, to finance your uh, finance your uh, technical capabilities, which you can uh, learn from uh, you know joining different courses, different programs. So they, they both actually reinforce each other, uh, this financial education and their technical skills. And uh, more technical skills you have these days and uh, more chances you have to uh, be employed and earn a, a reasonable a living uh, because uh, the age of having degrees is gone, basically. It's, it's the, it's the, uh, it's, no, we are now living in a world where degrees probably don't matter. It's the skills that matter. The employer would ask you what you can do for us. Uh, but if you say that, oh, yes, I have this degree, but I cannot do this, then you are of no use to the employer. So even if your degree is not good, you have the technical skills, your, uh, your probability of uh, being employed will uh, certainly rise. Yes, and, and you mentioned at some point um, cultural and other types of barriers. What do you mean more precisely under those? Okay, well, if, if you look at, uh, at the Central Asia, uh, the, these uh, uh, family and cultural uh, issues are deeply entrenched uh, in, in, in the financial decisions uh, in, in the Karik region. Uh, for example, uh, in most of the countries, uh, you would see uh, these young adults, they are heavily dependent on their families to finance for their education, to finance their uh, health uh, spending, uh, to finance, uh, uh, to provide uh, basic business equity when they graduate and they have to uh, start their businesses. Uh, similarly, uh, if you if you see the older adults, uh, instead of uh, you know going back to uh, the financial sector for uh, uh, for uh, raising funds, uh, they would go, uh, they would actually uh, reach out to their families and their friends uh, for borrowing. So this is very common in in this in Central Asia and also. Uh, uh, there are certain uh, uh, certain trust barriers uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, uh, for example, uh, most of these uh, Central Asian countries were part of the Soviet Union. And when uh, Soviet Union collapsed, uh, people actually lost a lot of their deposits. So that uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, shattered their trust in the, in the formal banking sector. Uh, and also uh, uh, because people are not uh, financially literate, so uh, they have this kind of um, hesitation to, uh, to, uh, uh, to reach to uh, the financial sector uh, for raising funds. Uh, for example, I gave you one example in Pakistan. Uh, I mean, uh, people actually, some people use this uh, e-commerce services, uh, make online purchases. But in most of the cases, the payment is not made online. Because they don't really trust whether their credit card, uh, uh, their credit card information will be leaked to somebody else. So what they do is uh, they actually uh, uh, pay cash on arrival. So this is a preferred mode of uh, uh, payment uh, 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 for online purchases in most of the carry countries. So these are the uh, trust and the institutional barriers uh, for which people are not really uh, using financial services in the region. And Halid, I was um, just listening to you and it crossed my mind. Um, would you say that in this region, for example, capital markets is, 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 um, uh, is, is developed and what kind of tool that could have been in, in um, all this um, discussion that we are uh, 
um, having uh, would that would that help um, to increase this um, financial uh, literacy and this uh, like openness to um, to getting to know these these uh, new new technologies and also the mindset right the mindset to be to be ready to embrace this uh, this new approaches well, I, th I think uh, this is a very great question because uh, capital markets play a very important role in uh, in, in, in in financialization uh, in in the side in the in the economy, and uh, which is a fundamental aspect of component of uh, uh, development policy. Because uh, without uh, provision of uh, adequate finance, uh, we cannot expect entrepreneurship. We cannot uh, expect our young generation, uh, you know, uh, thriving with their new ideas. Uh, so uh, if we look at the CARIC region, uh, the capital markets are not uh, very much developed, they're not mature, and you would be surprised to see that in some countries, we don't even have a, a stock exchange, uh, so to say. So the financial market uh, development is at very, uh, uh, at, uh, is at and it is infancy, it's very embryonic stage. And, uh, and also uh, there are other factors, for example, uh, nearly 20 to 40 percent of uh, uh, the economy is a shadow economy in the CARIC region. So all the transactions are done, uh, 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 cash transactions are done, like the payments, the loans, etc. So if if most of the transactions are done uh, uh, through cash, that means the credit worthiness is not determined. Similarly, the people are not literate how to use the how to use the financial services. So this. Uh, this uh, uh, the weak capital markets are pretty much responsible for low uh, financial inclusion levels in the region and if uh, uh, governments actually uh, uh, really uh, uh, the governments realize the urgency of financial inclusion and they want to uh, want to reach out to uh, the marginalized people who are uh, out, outside the financial mainstream then of course uh, financial markets needs to be developed they needs to be strengthened and they needs to be encouraged to come up with uh, financial instruments uh, to cater to different segments of the society. So uh, you are very right. This is very important to have a uh, very strong and uh, functioning, uh, uh, functioning uh, markets. ADB believes that going forward and to increase financial inclusion using fintech, governments and multilateral development partners need to collaborate to develop synergies and find affordable and sustainable solutions to improving financial inclusion. China, for Khalid, is one such successful case. Just look at these numbers. Uh, 1.7 billion people and of that 79% have a mobile phone account, uh, have a mobile phone subscription. So if I'm a businessman, to me, this is a great opportunity uh, because uh, we, we have this option to, uh, to customize our products and reach out to those 1.7 billion people who are, who are underserved. That is basically a non-consumption market. So instead of, uh, as a businessman, so instead of competing in the existing market, just devise something, just customize something for unserved people, which has a huge potential. You can devise your, you can customize your products in a way that can cater to their needs. So I see as a businessman, uh, it's a huge potential. Uh, it's a huge business, business, business opportunity to make a lot of profit. And in the, uh, at, at the same time, this, uh, you know, expanding this financial inclusion level. And for the governments, uh, I, I would emphasize that, uh, you don't need to uh, invent the wheel. The wheel is already there. So we have like uh, in the, within the CARIC region, we have very good example of China. China is a big country. And uh, if you look at China's uh, advancement in uh, financial technologies and financial inclusion, uh, you would see that uh, they have used their existing infrastructure, the government infrastructure, uh, particularly the postal services infrastructure in China. And then these uh, two tech juggernauts like uh, Ali, uh, Alibaba and Tencent, uh, they actually, uh, they innovated and they uh, developed products which, uh, to reach out to people uh, to actually cover that last mile, the people who are uh, at the fringes and who are at the frontiers. So now if, if you look at China's, uh, China's advancement, uh, you will see that uh, there are, uh, of China's total population, 70% of population is digitally active. So they are uh, using this WeChat and Alipay platform and uh, uh, making their financial decisions, uh, educated financial decisions based on the services they are being provided. 
similarly, we have other example in Kenya uh, where uh, this innovation and the investment was led by the private sector and the government only provided an enabling environment and uh, facilitated uh, these uh, initiatives uh, through easy regulations. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for the private sector, for the governments and the development partners to join hands and, uh, and uh, create an enabling environment where businesses can uh, flourish and the governments can only uh, provide this, uh, uh, the regulatory facilitation instead of controlling uh, uh, the development of financial uh, inclusion levels. So I think uh, th there's a huge potential uh, that is uh, lying in, uh, uh, in the CARIC region and it's up to the governments how they actually uh, realize this potential. And uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, people who will benefit uh, when uh, they receive these financial services and uh, the economies will grow, I'm sure. Well, this was Khalid Umar, economist at the ADB, who is also coordinating Karek Think Tanks Network and serves as a Chief of Strategic Planning Division at Karek Institute. Not going far from the financial sector, our next uh, guest of the show is Gia Murchila, the CEO of Foresight Capital, an investment company which has hit Georgia's market after its parliament approved the law on investment funds two years ago. Hello, I am glad to host you here in our TV studio. Uh, what are you up to? Hello, I'm glad we met. As you are aware, I've spent most of my career in the banking sector and later a significant portion of it in the private sector. With the experience I gained, my colleagues and I established an asset management company and an investment company. I'm talking about the Foresight Capital, in which I serve as a director general. Tell us about uh, Foresight Capital. Is it an asset management company only? Foresight Capital is an investment company offering new investment opportunities to Georgians. In our practice, bank deposits and residential real estate for further rent purposes are the most common investment instruments here. Investments offered by us to the market are different. The unit rate of the investment company or a stock is highly secure, meaning that any investment made by an investment company is secured by commercial real estate. Secondly, it has high return. We expect per, per unit revenue to be at least 5% per annum. And third is diversification. And do you mean the diversification of the portfolio? Uh, exactly. The portfolio is diversified because the investments are made in different companies operating in different fields, which of course, as I mentioned, are secured with commercial real estate. It is worth to be mentioned that Foresight Capital is a platform connecting businesses looking for flexible financing and investors with surplus resources. The investment company itself is registered by the National Bank of Georgia and operates under its supervision. With appropriate register and all the other relevant stages uh, that you must pass following all the corresponding procedures, Absolutely. We've come a long way in registering and studying the corresponding law, which on its side was difficult but interesting. The positioning of the investment companies alongside the banking sector happens uh, when the capital market is underdeveloped. I hope that soon it will change for the better. Good point. The policy and the concept of our investment company are that it does not compete with the banking sector, neither in terms of attracting nor allocating cash resources. Our financial instruments and investment policies are completely completely different from those of the banking sector and constitute a completely different instrument that is not secured in their policy. Was it one of the reasons that encouraged you to start an investment company with your partners or were there any other, other determinants? Around four to five years ago, we tried to register a company for the purpose of attracting and placing money, but in one of the foreign countries. Then, for various internal and external reasons, the process could not have been carried out. Have you been thinking on a similar format? Uh, we did. However, the law on investment funds passed by the Parliament of Georgia in 2020 made us realize the aspiration of creating this project. In December of 2020, we started communicating with the National Bank of Georgia on this issue, and it took us almost a year and a half to register the company, which was a very interesting process. Kia, what are the competitive advantages of Foresight Capital? You have mentioned some of them already, including the separation from the banking sector and uh, that they are secured by real estate. We have several competitive advantages. First, our main task is to insure investors. We achieve this by securing our investments by real estate. This one is the most important factor. It refers to specific locations as well as real estate owned and operated by the business itself. 
the, the business itself? Yes, the business itself, for which securing it with commercial real estate represents one of the main securities. Offering higher return is another competitive advantage. This is provided by banks in which we are investing. Their return is higher than of residential real estate or bank deposits. The third competitive advantage is diversification of the portfolio. I would like to mention company's team, both founders and the management, their professionalism, experience and dedication to their work, the knowledge they have acquired in the international or local market. That's exactly what my upcoming question is about. Your team members, partners with whom you were discussing the idea of creating the company, later registered at the central bank and finally launched Foresight Capital on the market. So, who are your team members? I sincerely believe that the greatest value in business is people. Archil Melikadze and Georgi Gogojuri are the founders of the company. Archil is a U.S. educated financier whom I think you know in person. He has a sound experience in financial and investment organizations, operating both internationally and locally. As for Georgi Gogojuri, he is a businessman behind many successful projects and has an acumen to discover interesting, profitable and successful deals. As for the management team that works with us, they are experienced lawyers, financiers, and investment analysts. While preparing for our interview, I came across two more people on your company's website whom I know well. One of them is Mr. Vano Vaktangishvili, the former vice president of the National Bank of Georgia. What role does Mr. Vaktangishvili has in the company? He is the member of the supervisory board. The supervisory board has been established in the company in accordance with the law. Do you mean the statutory requirement? Yes, it's a prerequisite of the Investment Fund Act. Levan Diasamidze is the chairman of the council. Levan has served at the top managerial position at Commercial Bank for years. Mr. Vano Vaktangishvili has been working in the Georgian banking sector for decades and was the vice president of the National Bank of Georgia for seven years, 15 years ago. How is the investment policy determined? Is the whole team involved? We worked hard on the writing of the investment document that was a statutory requirement. The document was developed by us, the founders. It was then approved by the board and then submitted for the registration to the central bank and agreed and approved by the bank's relevant department. Is the size of the fund charter capital legal requirement? Uh, this is relatively new law and you and some other companies are laying the groundwork. Currently, Foresight Capital is not large. It's a modest company with $30 million in value. The terms are determined for five years. It is a finite fund. It starts and ends at exact dates. Investors are receiving their returns during five years. They receive dividends on a weekly basis, while the fixed capital is returned at the end of the term. Is it secured by real estate during all the time? Besides that, what real estate are we talking about? We are talking about real estate with operating business, which on its side is our target company in which we are investing. The commercial real estate and its appraisal are the key factors influencing our investment decisions. Our company has and will have primary mortgages, primary collateral for real estate, and therefore this is a very important detail for our company and its investors. Beyond competitive rates and other advantages, do you think that real estate will present itself as a major competitive advantage for the market? Definitely. It's the cornerstone of, of our business. One can't find real estate investment instruments with such a high interest rate easily in the market. Here, interest rates are incomparably higher than those of deposits. This is an imperative d detail for our business. We do not take operational risks when investing. Our investment is focused primarily on property, which in most cases includes real estate. Herewith, I would like to give an example of one of our projects in which we are investing. I'm all ears. Uh, it is a medical company that owns real estate, where in the meantime an international clinic is operating. The latter is the operational company of the former. Our investment will be directed to the company that owns this real estate in this component, and not only that, with our investment we will also purchase additional motor equipment for the operating company to allow it to function successfully. This model works for everyone because the operating company will reallocate its resources to development and provision of improved service and will share the rent fee, the cost of the equipment and the cost of the property with us, the investors. As often as not, we invest in real estate, although it can sometimes be a partially movable property, which is a major part of the business that operates there, but for which we get a quarterly rent fee.
You have chosen an interesting model indeed. I'm glad to witness the flourishing of various business models that create alternatives in our slowly developing capital market. Let me present my own example. When I went to a bank to prolong my deposit, I was offered less than 1% interest rate on foreign currency. It wasn't long ago. First, I got angry, but then realized that there were huge opportunities in the market. So we started this business. We see how low the interest rates on deposits are. As for the residential real estate, the rate in the case of successful renting is not high. It has high maintenance cost and takes time. Therefore, our product is competitive and better than other options. From this uh, newly established Business TV studio, I would like to send my uh, warm greetings to your partners and wish you best of luck. Thank you for your visit. Much obliged. And before we say goodbye, let us close up with my favorite and one of the oldest rubrics in the checkpoints, and that's made in Georgia. Today we will be telling you how different cultures can reinforce each other and bring something totally new to the consumers. Marina Merabishvili, the founder of What's Fish and Chips, has brought British culture to Georgia and offered a combination of fish and chips to Georgian consumers. The facility is mostly visited by people who have lived in the UK and have a nostalgia for this favorite. Dish. Their assessments are also interesting. They say that the Georgian restaurant prepares exactly the same fish and chips as in the UK. So if you decide to taste this combination, keep in mind that what's fish and chips will host you from 8 o'clock in the morning. And if you do not want to start your morning with fish, you will be offered a British breakfast on the spot. <laughs> What's uh, Fish and Chips has brought the British mood to Old Tbilisi a few months ago. Guests here will find a comfortable environment and delicious food. The taste here is determined by British cuisine. The main dish on the menu is fish and chips. A foreign combination for Georgian cuisine is the symbol of the Great Britain. Almost 4,000 kilometers away in England, the first fish and chips facility opened in 1860, and since then it became popular in the whole England. This environment will make all the guests want to travel to the UK, or on the contrary, it can alleviate the longing for the London environment. Georgian hostess Marina Merabishvili will welcome you with her usual hospitality from early morning with a traditional British breakfast and then offer you the main dish, classic fish and chips. While being in Scotland, a friend had a pub and I had them. There I learned how to prepare dish as well as took a different approach not only to this dish but also to a different lifestyle, which I did not know, but seemed interesting. A lot of people gathered in the pub, they drank beer, whiskey and eat fish and chips. Of course, there are separate shops for fish and chips. The main thing is to take it home. They usually have to eat fish and chips at least once a week. What's Fish and Chips hosts up to 60 customers per day. However, most restaurant customers prefer the delivery service. At the end of the day, the hostess always reads the guest reviews gathered during the day. Customers mostly write that What's Fish and Chips is a British analogy. Moreover, they note that they are exactly like the one made in Scotland. This is the best assessment because the British favorite dish is made in Scotland. The guest reviews read that it's a classic British fish and chips and they have not eaten such a outside of Britain. Moreover, it's also noted that such fish and chips are mostly only in Scotland. The dish is not tasty everywhere in London, but it's good everywhere in Scotland, even if you visit the basement cafe. Up to six fish dishes, shrimps with the various delicious soups, desserts, top quality coffee. This is an incomplete list of the menu. Moreover, what's fish and chips goes beyond the traditional British cuisine and Georgian fusion steps in, calling for the menu to be even more diverse in future. We have one dish, which is not traditional British dish. These are fish sticks. They are sold very well. It's our fictional dish. We want to ruin the legend that Georgians don't like fish. Everyone loves well-prepared fish, so we want to bring black sea fish in our menu. 
The original goal of creating a small gathering place where guests could feel the British aura has already been fulfilled. As Marina Merabishvili says, now the circle should be expanded and this object should become a favorite place for Georgians. Well, that's all for today. Do not forget to keep following us on Forbes.g and BM.g and see you next Sunday. Same time, same team, different content. The Checkpoint is presented by GM Pharma, the first international multinational pharmaceutical company in Georgia. GM Pharma, to serve those who need it most.